So this is a, a bit of a different kind of video than we normally do. Um, this is being broadcast out into stream on Twitch and I'm basically I'm attempting something new with this um, to see how this goes down. So today what we're covering is the tomb of Tutankhamun and basically the, the, the death of Tutankhamun and why this is kind of a weird tomb. So first of all this is the tomb. So this is in the Valley of the Kings in Egypt. Um, it comprises of four main chambers and a pathway that goes up into the Valley of the Kings. This is sand on the walls, not here. I appreciate this 3D model isn't the greatest at, at showing those textures, uh, but this is this is supposed to be sand. And this is the general layout of Tutankhamun's tomb. So you had a main chamber here on the entrance, you had the, the sort of burial chamber, and you had two chambers here which were basically full of stuff. Um, if I was to show you what that looked like as an image, sort of looked like this. Um, so you've got the, the antechamber, this was full of junk, well say junk, uh, the most expensive things you've probably ever seen in your life. More stuff, more stuff, main tomb. You can tell that here um, Tutankhamun was buried in kind of like a Russian nesting doll situation. So he had a, a, a gold mask over his face and then he was inside of um, sort of a, a, a body cast made out of gold and then inside of a tomb, inside of another tomb, inside of another tomb and inside of another tomb. So it's, it's really protected in there. If I was to go to the Valley of the Kings, um, so Tutankhamun was buried here in Egypt. Um, when they uh, found him, his uh, tomb was covered in, in, uh, in rocks. The reason they found him is that the, the actual tomb was covered in more rocks than it should have been comparatively to all the other tombs. Because what they would have done when they buried him is that this chamber here would have been flooded with stone, this kind of uh, pathway down, flooded with stone. And there would have been doorways blocking off entrances all the way down. And then when they finished burying Tutankhamun, they would have covered his whole thing in, in giant boulders. So when Howard Carter came in in the 1920s, he discovered that the tomb was still covered in loads of boulders, which was a bit weird considering how many of these tombs had already been robbed, which is why uh, Tutankhamun's tomb was so surprising, because it was basically the first tomb around here that was full of all of its artifacts in the Valley of the Kings. So this is the tomb. When it was first discovered and they first went down here, there is, uh, they entered into this room here, this uh, antechamber, and this wall was completely blocked off. But they knew that there, was, there had to be something behind it because of these two statues. So you can see these two sort of guardian statues. So this would have been a plain white wall and they would have suspected that these two were protecting something, right? Obviously, this is absolutely full of treasures from Tutankhamun's life, like the, the mother load of, of Egyptology, essentially. They busted a hole through this wall, put a candle in to, to uh, uh, prove their assumptions, um, may or may not have had a permit to do that, discovered the tomb, and then later on they came in and they, they, they cracked it open. What they discovered inside was essentially a tomb that was way too big for the room that it was in. So if you look at the size of this thing, you, you can barely get around this. You can't, you know, you struggle to, to, to walk around something this huge. And if you look at the tomb uh, that they found, it's covered in hieroglyphs that say like north, south, east, west. The idea being that the when they were packing this, this tomb in, they needed directions on how to unpack the, the sarcophagus. Uh, so this was sort of flat packed when it came in and then assembled inside because there'd be no way of getting that, you know, through the door. And the, the interesting thing about that is that actually those are in the wrong place. So the symbol for North isn't on the North wall, um, suggesting that he was sort of crammed in there as, as best as they could make do with, which is interesting because he was, he was a Pharaoh. He was a, a very young Pharaoh and he was, he was um, proclaimed Pharaoh very young, but still for a Pharaoh, this is, you would say quite, strange. So they came into the tomb, they unpacked all of this, they broke through this door, this is where the two guards would have been. They walk into this tomb and then they see a giant colossal sarcophagus filling this room. Now there's a few things about this room that are a bit strange. So first of all the room is unfinished. So if you look at the the paintings of some of these 
these baboons here, the the painting isn't finished. So if I was to zoom in, for example, on these monkeys, uh, well, these baboons, for example, the penis of this baboon isn't highlighted in black. The rest of them are. So it wasn't proofread. It wasn't gone over with a fine tooth comb like you would have expect for a Fero. The next thing you'll notice is that it's covered in these little black dots. And what this suggests is that it wasn't dry when they started painting it because this is mold. This is... Uh, black dots of mold and if you looked at any other temples you wouldn't see this on the paint you know that the paint would be very fresh almost like it was painted yesterday but because it was wet it managed to mold before they closed it up it probably didn't look like this when they were finished but by the time they closed it up mold set in and then it caused all of this damage to the actual paintwork on the walls if you looked at a 3d scan of um, Tutankhamun's tomb took a 3d scan of these faces you could see brush strokes, indentation brush strokes of the paint, essentially evidencing that they painted it while it was still wet. So it was a real rush job. Uh, if you took, a, say, a scan of Ramesses II's tomb, you can see that the images aren't just painted, they're, they're carved in, they are you know, etched into the stone. The stone is very flat, the images are etched in, and then they're painted over. And if you took a 3D scan of those tombs, you could see the image very clearly on the 3D scan. But on this, what you see is the brush strokes. You see the where the where the brushes hit the, the wet plaster and drew lines across the plaster. So what did we find inside of this tomb? So first and foremost, you can see here on the left, you have things like chariots, uh, you have uh, bows and arrows, you have famous trunk, Tutankhamun, all the worldly possessions, you know, the boats, the, the wooden boats. Uh, there's a very famous ram's head, probably seated right here, which is coated in like a, like a gold leaf. The one thing that this doesn't do is really explain Tutankhamun, because there's, there's a, a few conflicting theories as to how Tutankhamun actually died. So if I was to look, for example, at this trunk, so this is the trunk from that image. You can see here, this is Tutankhamun on his chariot, uh, on horseback, fighting off some, some other African kingdoms with a bow and arrow. Very sort of warrior pose. You can see it again on the roof here, and it's, it's pretty much on all, decorated on all sides. Very intricately detailed, impossibly well preserved, essentially, for, for how old it is. But what this presents is a Egyptian pharaoh that was a warrior. He went into battle and 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 he was he was good with a bow and that's sort of how he presents himself but then if you look at his x-ray you can see that he really didn't have the capability to do any of that so for example on on his feet one of his feet are really misshapen so his toes are sort of pointing out at the wrong angle this left foot here it sort of leans off to the side uh, it's very, very warped, very curved, like almost like hooked. This kneecap here, this, uh, this has had a, a serious, serious injury to it. Like we're, we're talking modern day, this would be caused by like getting hit by a car. And uh, it's likely that something like this would have killed him. You know, he, he would have either died from blood loss or from the ensuing infection. And then on the other side of his foot, his foot is very flat foot, suggesting he's sort of leaned to one side a lot so he, he sort of stayed off of his bad leg so you can't imagine really this kind of guy doing this and you wonder whether or not his injury was caused by some kind of chariot crash maybe he fell off of his chariot maybe he was stomped on by a horse but the problem is that also inside of this tomb they found canes like walking sticks some of those were ceremonial obviously for his normal duties but some of them were actually used. You can see the, the scuff marks on the bottom of the, of the canes, suggesting that he used them a lot. And he was quite young. So the idea that he you know, needed a cane and he was quite young sort of throws aside this theory that he was a warrior king. And then aside from all of that, there's evidence that Tutankhamun actually had malaria as well, which could also explain why he died so young. Certainly he died, must have died quite suddenly. Another thing to look at when you look at his skeleton is his image. So you can see here he's got this sort of protruding jawline, almost, uh, I want to say Freddie Mercury-esque. 
But if you looked at, say, an image of his face mask, it doesn't really expose any of that. It's almost symmetrically handsome, idealized vision of what the uh, beauty would look like. Uh, so it doesn't really look like it's meant for his head. And there's more evidence of this in the fact that he was in sort of like a nesting doll situation. So if we go back to this image where you can see him sort of lined up, he had a face mask on and then he was inside of one tomb and inside of another tomb. And the face masks for all of these layers, they don't seem to match up either, suggesting that the masks weren't actually made for him. They were, they were potentially something that was just lying around that looked similar that they just gave to him because they don't look the same as each other. So at the moment we've got a situation where Tutankhamun's tomb, it's quite small for for his, gra his, you know, his stature and his grandeur. The tomb wasn't put in properly. The paintwork was rushed. His cause of death seemed to be quite sudden. And uh, he didn't look like he was supposed to be wearing the the regalia that they, that they gave him. So there's a few questions to answer there. First of all, what happened? You know, why why is this tomb so poorly looked after? Why is it so um, so rushed? You know, why is it why is it so humble? Why isn't it painted and decorated all the way around? Why is the the ceiling, for example, in this room? Why isn't this painted? All the ceilings in all the pharaoh's temples and uh, well in pharaoh's tombs were, were painted like they had stars on the ceiling and all this kind of thing so so what happened exactly i'm gonna switch conversation for a minute to talk about something else and you'll see where i'm coming back to with this this is an image on the wall of his tomb it's this one here so these two characters this is tutankhamun here as as a mummy in this case stood upright after being mummified and this is uh, what we call a Sem priest. Now, a Sem priest is essentially the, the head priest of a burial. And in the case of this situation, what you're looking at is something called the opening of the mouth ceremony. And this is something that happens right at the end of a funeral. So the, the mummy would be held upright, um, sometimes by somebody dressed as Anubis. And the eldest son, the firstborn son, would dress up in this, uh, this leopard skin cloak and would touch the various body parts of Tutankhamun with religious implements. And the idea is that it would open up the senses to the afterlife, so they would be able to see, they'd be able to hear, they'd be able to smell, and, and it would reawaken them, essentially. And that would be the last thing that would happen. The reason they wear this leopard skin is that it represents uh, strength, so like a victory over, over, I believe, Set, who was defeated in the form of a leopard. And the reason that this happens is that this essentially reenacts the first mummification and rebirth. So you have Osiris and Horus, the, the father and the son, where um, Osiris was mummified and reborn as the sort of Lord of the Underworld, and Horus acted as his sort of sem priest, his, his way to, to immortality. The problem you've got with this, and you, you'll, you'll realize where I'm getting to very quickly with this. The problem is, Tutankhamun didn't have any sons. He didn't have any children at all. So the question becomes, who is this? Because if this is supposed to be his firstborn son, then who is it? You know, who, who, who is this supposed to be? Now the benefit we have is that he's actually named here and his name is I. And you can see if you read his Wikipedia page that I was actually the successor to Tutankhamun. So his predecessor was Tutankhamun. And you can see his image here. Very famous image. He was succeeded by a man called Horemheb. And then he was succeeded by Ramesses I. But basically, the, the idea is that I and Horemheb and Tutankhamun, they all lived in the same time period. Tutankhamun died extremely quickly extremely suddenly. I was a politician or a, you know, a high ranking official and Horemheb was a military general. And the theory goes that Tutankhamun died quickly and to seize power, 
I had Tutankhamun buried extremely quickly so that he could take over and uh, Horemheb would have nothing to say about it. And what you would have is this situation where I would himself act as the firstborn son, representing the firstborn son, lending legitimacy to his own position that he is the successor to Tutankhamun. So Tutankhamun would be buried in, you know, in a, a, a grave that doesn't seem to be fit for a pharaoh, rushed, put in the ground, you know, given all the dignities that they can give him, and then I would take over and become pharaoh, and Horemheb would have nothing to say about it. And you can tell, because as soon as I became pharaoh, he lasted a, a few years, Horemheb then took over. Um, and you can uh, possibly understand uh, how that happened. So there's, there's some evidence to this. So uh, this is a um, Karnak. So this is a temple called Karnak. Uh, it's the biggest site of religion in history. Uh, it's, it's almost like a um, cathedral in Barcelona. It was, it was built and then another bit was built on top and then another bit was built on top and another bit was built on top until it became this almost city-sized temple. So a pharaoh would have their temples that they build on top of this to honor, uh, I don't know, the previous pharaoh or something that, that, some victory that they've had. And what happened is, is that when I became the pharaoh, after uh, Tutankhamun died, I built temples for Tutankhamun. And we know this because if you look through what is essentially this desert of stones on the outside, you can see the remnants of all of those with Tutankhamun's name on the stone that were destroyed by Horemheb when he became pharaoh. So Horemheb came in and he decided, I'm not having any of this, and literally wiped out the legacy of Ai and Tutankhamun by destroying the temples. And you can go through the, the stones outside of Karnak and you can see T uh, Tutankhamun by name in these stones. And that, I think, pretty much covers it. I hope that was interesting enough for you and uh, I'll call it there.